Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar about Master of Science in Bioscience, Technology, and Public Policy. While we are waiting for um, you know, other attendees to join, uh, we will get us started. So my name is Michaela Wickramasinghe. I'm the Graduate Recruitment and Training Officer um, at the University of Winnipeg Faculty of Graduate Studies. And I'm joining from Winnipeg. Um, Manitoba Treaty 1 territory that we are sharing with the many Indigenous communities for many, many years. So welcome and good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're joining from. We are so happy to have you um, in this webinar. Uh, today we will talk about the program as well as the outcomes or career um, options that you have after graduating, um, both in academia as well as industry. So to do that, we have an amazing panel. We have Dr. Craig Willis, um, professor and the graduate program chair for MSc Bioscience program. And we have Michelle Baltron, who is a student in the program. She's also the 2023 winner of the three minute thesis. Um, and she will be competing in uh, Saskatchewan next week. So we don't accept anything that, but you're bringing home the, the cup. <laughs> and we also have Bradley Howell, or Brad Howell, who is at the end of his um, MAC program, who's already accepted to a PhD program in Ontario. I will let him talk more about that later. One thing you may notice that he might give you some tips about not procrastinating, because he's not someone who procrastinates. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce a little bit about our graduate faculty and, um, and the, um, the University of Winnipeg. So the Faculty of Graduate Studies is a small faculty. Um, we have a small number of programs, quite innovative and multidisciplinary. We have wonderful professors, um, that includes a number of Canada research chairs. We do have excellent funding opportunities and exceptional employment rates upon graduation. We have Master of Arts programs in economics, criminal justice, cultural studies, and indigenous governance. We have professional programs in development practice with the indigenous focus, management, and marriage and family therapy. And the science programs in environmental science, bioscience, uh, which you will learn more today, as well as applied computer science. We also have several programs that we offer jointly with the University of Manitoba, another large campus in Manitoba, um, that includes arts programs in history, religion, peace and conflict studies, and professional program in public administration. So that is my introduction. I am now going to hand over to Dr. Willis to talk more about the bioscience program. Great, thanks so much, Michaela. Let me just get my screen share going here if I can do it properly. I think that's the right one, isn't it? Good. Great. Well, thank you so much, Michaela, for putting this together. Thank you all for joining us uh, today uh, and for your interest in, in our master's program. Uh, yeah, as Michaela said, I'm Dr. Willis. I'm a professor in biology and I, I chair uh, the bioscience uh, technology, uh, technology and public policy program. Um, and uh, so an obvious question, I think, uh, to start is why consider graduate school? I think everyone that's here is probably considering graduate school or you wouldn't be here. Why uh, consider graduate school and why think about our program in particular? So those are a couple of questions I, I hope I can try and answer uh, today. And then we'll hear from Michelle and Brad to help us answer them even better than I can. Um, I think one of the good reasons I think sort of shown on uh, this slide is that this uh, provides specialized training. And I'll talk a little bit more about how uh, our master's program helps you specialize in a field that you might be interested in. Um, a master's program uh, in many parts of the world isn't required for uh, placement in a PhD program, 
but in uh, uh, many parts of the world, it's strongly preferred. Um, and it's seen as an advantage uh, because it shows potential supervisors and potential PhD programs that you've managed your own project, that you've done all the things required to be a successful researcher. We'll talk about some of those things as we go. Um, and uh, that you can get to the, to the end of a finish line on, on something like that, on an academic project. So it's a great pathway to a PhD. But it's also, for some people that don't want to pursue a PhD, a great pathway to a fantastic career. Um, there uh, are great job placement opportunities for folks with a master's degree uh, in bioscience in particular. Um, and uh, many, many of our graduate students, the vast majority, end up with careers in their fields. Um, there is uh, certainly greater income potential if you've got advanced training. We'll look at some data about that in a second. Um, and uh, in terms of our program, uh, obviously, we know that being a grad student is expensive. Um, there are tuition costs. There are costs of living. Um, and uh, we try to provide good funding opportunities for students uh, that uh, undertake our program. So we'll talk about uh, those funding opportunities uh, in a bit as well, right? So great reasons to pursue graduate uh, school, and we think some great reasons to pursue graduate school in our program. Right? Uh, in terms of career paths uh, and where you might end up, right? I think this flow chart sums up uh, post-secondary training or post-secondary education and the pathway to career really uh, nicely. So uh, we're kind of talking at the master's degree level, right? Some folks will decide to start their professional degree right from there. Some folks will decide to start their academic career or continue their academic career from there and pursue a PhD, right? And a number of our students also take a professional career step in the middle. So some of my own former students have gone off, gotten a job in industry, for example, uh, working for, say, a consulting firm or for the government, uh, and then have opted to do uh, additional graduate school training, off, uh, opted to do a, a PhD later, and ended up with uh, even better career prospects as a result, right? Um, there are obviously some income benefits for obtaining a master's degree. And these data from Statistics Canada show that, I think, really nicely. Um, if you pursue a career with an undergraduate degree, here's what you can expect for your starting salary in your first year uh, or in your first five years. There's about a 40 to 45 percent higher salary for uh, folks on average that pursue a master's degree, right? Now, I don't think as someone who's kind of passionate about science and passionate uh, about biology, that money is the most important thing. And it's not even really in my top five of most important things. Uh, getting to do work that you're passionate about and that you find interesting to me is worth a whole lot more. Um, and hopefully to, to folks like you, but obviously money is nice and we all need it, right? So that's uh, a bit of a bonus of getting to do cool work that uh, you find exciting. So lots of graduate programs offer similar things. Um, want to talk a little bit about what we're trying to do a little bit differently uh, to uh, add some value to uh, a master's in bioscience or a master's in biology, right? So our program really has three objectives. The first of those uh, is to give world-class hands-on experiential training in a specialized area of biology or bioscience, right? And that's kind of what most graduate programs in biology would offer. We uh, add a, a little bit to this. Uh, we add some coursework to this uh, objective, as we'll talk about in a second. But really, that's your thesis work with your supervisor. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, all graduate programs in biology arguably are trying to do that. We're trying to do a couple of additional things to give our graduates a bit of a leg up uh, in terms of their career opportunities. And, and, and one of those really important things is to learn a bit about how to connect uh, the research you're doing, which is often a little bit siloed, a little bit spe specialized, a little bit technical, um, into uh, the kinds of policy actions, policy developments, 
policy recommendations for folks in government and industry that can really let you apply the work you're doing, the science you're doing to benefit society. And that's often a disconnect. I've I think we've seen that really uh, sort of sadly and frustratingly throughout the pandemic that science doesn't always connect uh, smoothly with policy, right? Uh, we're trying to give students tools so that they understand how policymakers perhaps think, they understand how policymakers make decisions, and they understand how they can potentially influence those decisions in po positive ways for the world, right? Now, our third objective is really linked with that second one. Uh, if you're going to do that, you need to be able to communicate very effectively, not just to other scientists, but to a range of audiences. And so we try and give students a bunch of opportunities, whether that's through our seminars course and giving uh, multiple seminars throughout their program, whether that's through uh, opportunities for public outreach, like Let's Talk Science, we're really active in that program and others, uh, whether it's through other opportunities to interact with uh, other scientists and with the public, uh, we uh, really try and uh, help students improve their communication skills so that they can apply their science uh, for benefits to society. So how do we do that? Well, our first objective is, as I mentioned, mostly focus on working closely with a faculty supervisor, right? Uh, and one of the, the really cool things I think about our program is the huge breadth of research that our students undertake and that our supervisors are involved in, right? Everything from wildlife conservation, uh, and uh, so students in my lab and myself, we work on endangered bats. Here's Brad with a trophy fish. He does cool work on the physiology and behavior of fish. Here's Michelle, who we're gonna hear about in a second with an actual trophy, not just a trophy fish for her awesome three minute thesis presentation about her work on basically how the gut works and how we can apply tools in human biomedicine to make lives of people better, right? So we have folks working in conservation, working in evolutionary genetics and genomics, working in human biomedicine, and our students work closely and learn the specialized techniques and tools uh, from all of those sub-disciplines uh, by their thesis work with their supervisors. So that's really the kind of flagship of the program. And that's similar to many master's programs, uh, thesis-based master's programs uh, throughout the world where we do ask a little bit more of our students and provide a little bit more value, I think, for our students is in a bit of extra coursework than many programs require, right? So this is a hideously boring looking slide that you can also see in our graduate program calendar, but it just gives you a sense of the, the courses that uh, our students, uh, not an exhaustive list of courses that our students can take, but the really key ones that provide the, uh, or that add to this breadth of training. So really important for the communication piece is our seminars in biology course. And that's where students like Michelle, who's working uh, in human health, and Brad, who's working in fisheries and fish biology, uh, students working in these really broad areas have to learn how to give a seminar that everyone else in the program can understand. They're in that course together, right? Uh, and so we've got to uh, help you learn to communicate to a big range of audiences, right? Everyone is enrolled in the thesis course throughout the program. Uh, that's where you're working with your supervisor on uh, your thesis project. But then we also have a, a specialized bioscience and policy course where we cover a whole range of issues in how uh, bioscience can be applied to, uh, to policy development, policy application, okay? Um, we uh, add to the training you get with our supervisor with a couple of other courses that folks all take. Uh, some core bioscience courses, and there are some options here. You've got to take at least one of these courses, and then some core technology courses. And uh, the options vary depending on whether you're more a genetics, genomics, and lab-based person, or perhaps a, a, um, a field-based ecologist or evolutionary biologist working out in the forest or in the grasslands, okay? Uh, and then we have some other options as well that can supplement uh, the opportunities to learn about applying science to, to policy 
um, uh, as you uh, continue your career in science. Um, now, some examples of careers, and I'm just going to stop. I don't have the chat open. Um, so uh, maybe we'll, I'll, if Michaela, you're kind of tracking the questions, I think, in the chat. So I'll, uh, I'll if there's those, we'll address all those at the end if they haven't been covered already. Does that sound good, Michaela? Yes, for sure. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Great. Um, okay, so uh, out of this program, when folks finish this program, where do our students end up? As I mentioned, we've got a pretty great track record of our students ending up in, in cool and useful positions. Uh, and so some of our students have ended up working for the federal government in Canada. So the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, for example, uh, um, uh, we've got a number of students that have ended up with careers there, including as a fish and habitat protection biologist. Uh, the National Microbiology Lab, this is a big deal uh, federal laboratory in Canada, a big research facility that's located right here in Winnipeg. It's the only facility in Canada that has a level four biosafety uh, facility. So uh, it's very important to biomedical research in Canada. Um, and uh, we have great interaction with that facility and some of our students have ended up in jobs over there. Um, some of our students have ended up in the private sector. So a number of our students end up in uh, environmental consulting firms. Um, and uh, if students are uh, interested in pursuing PhD research and academic careers, many have gone on to uh, PhDs with prestigious PhD scholarships. So Canada graduate scholarships from NSERC, our federal funding agency. Um, we've had students go on to Harvard, the University of Guelph, uh, all sorts of universities across North America and the world. Um, and many of those students have continued to be successful. So one of our really uh, um, great graduates uh, from the past decade or so, Dr. Quinn Weber, is now a professor at the University of Guelph. Um, and so we've had a number of our students end up in faculty positions uh, if they've decided to pursue the academic route. Okay, now to some nuts and bolts of the program and the application progress. First, uh, we have to talk about the price. Uh, there is a tuition cost, obviously, of attending graduate school. Um, and so we uh, have our domestic tuition fees and our international tuition fees. Domestic tuition in Canada. Uh, for uh, uh, Canadian citizens and permanent residents is subsidized by tax dollars uh, from the federal and provincial governments, which is why those uh, amounts for domestic students are lower. Um, these are uh, values uh, or amounts of about 2300 per term for a domestic student, 4800 per term for an international student, all these in the uh, rounded to the nearest uh, Canadian dollar. Um, we try to offset those costs as much as we can with funding support, right? So the University of Winnipeg has many internal scholarships uh, that uh, our students in our program are often very successful in winning um, that help to uh, uh, provide uh, an annual stipend or support an annual stipend. All of the students that we accept into our program, whether they're international students or domestic students, are guaranteed a minimum funding level. Sometimes all of that funding will come from a supervisor's research grants. Uh, other times it will come partly from the supervisor, partly from scholarships like those on your screen here, partly from a teaching assistantship, um, doing some lab instructing in our undergraduate program. But we guarantee a minimum set amount. Uh, it's not quite, and I'll be totally upfront, it's typically not quite enough to live on. So uh, important that if you're interested in pursuing uh, our program, you look carefully at a budget um, and you think carefully about some savings uh, so that you can afford it. It's an investment in your future. We argue that it's worth it, uh, but it, uh, uh, it takes some upfront investment, right? That said, we try and defray those costs as much as we possibly can with funding support. Now, let's say you are interested in applying. Uh, the very first step uh, to applying to our program is approaching and confirming that you have a supervisor willing to take you on in their laboratory. 
And so the best way to do that, we kind of deliberately don't have a list of people, of potential supervisors on our website because it changes from year to year, depending on what funding opportunities uh, supervisors have, what uh, projects they're undertaking, what their research programs look like. But uh, what I'd strongly encourage interested folks to do is to look at the websites of the Department of Biology or these other departments in the University of Winnipeg. We have supervisors in other departments in addition to biology. Michelle can maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, her supervisor comes from kinesiology and applied health. Uh, lots of folks doing bioscience relative research across the university. Um, and so those folks are eligible to supervise students in our program. Uh, I usually like to see for my own part when a, a graduate student, a prospective student is interested in working in my lab uh, is an email indicating that they perhaps read a little bit of my research and know what we do. Um, the, I always like to see a, a CV or resume. And I often like to see even just an unofficial transcript or a statement of grades, right? And then we can start the discussion about whether that uh, there are opportunities in my lab uh, for them to join me. Uh, not all supervisors definitely want to see the same thing, but that's a useful, probably a useful starting point. And maybe, maybe Michelle and Brad can touch on that uh, in a bit as well. So you want to make sure that the supervisor has a place for you in their lab and has funding to support you. Okay, that's crucial. They will need to cover the costs of your research and they will also need to contribute to your stipend. That is the uh, amount of money that will help you pay rent and tuition and put groceries in the fridge. Okay, uh, so you're making an investment in your future. Your supervisor is also making an investment by providing some funding. And so you want to put your best foot forward in that initial introduction um, and make it clear that, uh, that uh, you're interested in the research area that they work in. You've given some thought to what they do. You understand the work they do. Um, and uh, you can make a contribution to, to help advance their program while you get some great training from them. Okay. At that point, you want to make sure that your qualifications meet the entry requirements. We'll touch on those in a second. And then the application process is entirely uh, online. So what are those entry requirements? Uh, typically, a four-year undergraduate degree or an honors degree in a relevant field. Obviously, uh, conditions or, or types of degree requirements vary around the world. So that's something that we uh, have to look at carefully during the application process. Uh, but typically, a four-year undergraduate degree with a similar level of credit hours in biology or a related field as our undergraduate program at the University of Winnipeg. So if you're curious about what the sort of uh, um, maybe uh, ideal program for acquiring admission to our master's program might be, look at the undergraduate calendar for the University of Winnipeg. That will tell you the kind of background that we sort of expect our students to have. The reason that's important is because the vast majority of our master's students end up doing some teaching in our undergraduate program. And so if you don't have uh, that background, that part, as well as your thesis work, is going to be very tough indeed, right? We want students that have achieved great marks, right? Uh, a GPA of three or a B is uh, typically the minimum. Uh, the better the GPA, the more likely uh, you are to uh, um, receive a scholarship um, or additional funding support. Um, and that makes it easier for a supervisor to accept you, okay? So uh, the higher your grades, the better, right? That's just a fact of uh, life in the academic world. Um, you need to demonstrate proof of uh, English proficient, proficiency. The language of instruction here at the University of Winnipeg is English, um, and there are some great resources on the university website uh, for you to find that. You don't have to do a GRE or comparable standardized grad level exam, okay? When it comes time to apply, here's the list of kind of supporting documents. You need transcripts and proof of your degree. You need uh, proof of your English language requirement. You need a CV or resume. 
Uh, you need to work with your supervisor, your prospective supervisor on a short research proposal. Or proposal. You're not by any means locked into doing that for your project, right? But it, it just shows that you and the supervisor have had a chance to interact and put uh, some sort of broad brushstrokes uh, behind a, a vague idea or a general idea of a project. And then you need two referees to say wonderful things about you, uh, about your background and your uh, chance to succeed in a graduate program. Uh, in terms of the timeline, so our applications typically open in November uh, and then close. The deadline is February 1st. Um, it's possible that students can be accepted after that February 1st deadline, but only if a supervisor uh, really has funding and is really keen for you to join their group. Um, we're typically making all our decisions in February and March, and often uh, there's a bit of a delay here as we wait to hear about funding decisions that affects how many offers we can make, uh, but our offer letters go out uh, from March to May. Uh, you'll be notified. Uh, uh, whether you've been accepted, right? And then in September, the fun begins and uh, almost all of our students start in September. We really like that approach because it ends up uh, creating, uh, building a cohort of students that are all at the same uh, place. Our year one and year two students end up hanging out a bunch. Uh, they end up working together a bunch in various uh, courses. Um, and really, I think, get to know each other. And maybe that's something that Brad and Michelle can talk about a bit more. Okay. And so with that, I'll thank you for your attention. I don't want to take away too much of Michelle and Brad's time. So I don't know, Michaela, I'll let you decide whether we want to hold all the questions till the end or, or do a few now or, or see what we want to do. But thanks so much for coming. Thanks for your attention. Um, and I'll turn it over to Michelle and Brad. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. That's a really uh, that's really great information about the program and outcomes, as well as a little bit about application process. I'm going to touch on one question because it's really related to what you mentioned now. Um, so one of the students asking, I have two year bachelor and two year master's degree. Sixteen years education is completed. Can I apply for master degree? Uh I, we have to look at the, we, I, that's a great question. And we often receive uh, inquiries like that. So two years of undergrad, two years of master's. Uh, again, I think the best uh, sort of uh, guideline to compare to would be the four-year Bachelor of Science in Biology program from the undergraduate calendar, right? And if you've got all or most of the experience offered by those courses in our undergraduate program, then no problem. You're very almost certain to be acceptable in terms of your background, right? Um, that said, you don't necessarily have to have all of those. We would take a close look at the background and see what courses you've got and what grades you got in those courses when we're trying to assess whether the, the goal is to have our master students be successful. So we don't want to take people that are going to really have a hard time, right? So that's really what we're trying to figure out. There's also the possibility of a qualifying year. So what we have offered to students from time to time that have some gaps in their background that we think are going to make them struggle is a qualifying year where they enroll in undergraduate courses for the year. Uh, I or whoever happens to be the program chair would work with the supervisor to figure out a program for a year that can bolster your background so that you could be accepted the year after. Okay, hopefully that answers it. Thank you, I think it did. So I'm gonna wait to answer. I have been answering some of the questions um, typing and uh, I think we have come to talk um, to our students now, which is really exciting. So I'm gonna uh, take a break on answering questions. So um, we have some questions prepared for you, Michelle, and for you, Brad. Um, the first question is to provide us a brief introduction um, and talk a little bit about your degree and your career goals. Maybe I'll start with Michelle because you're the closest to me. Sounds good. 
Hi everyone, my name is Michelle. I am a second year grad student here at the University of Winnipeg, working towards my Master of Science in Bioscience Technology and Public Policy. I also did my Bachelor of Science here at the University of Winnipeg as well, where I majored in biochemistry. So I've actually been here at the University of Winnipeg for over six years now. So clearly I really love this school so much. Uh, as for my research, I work under the supervision of Dr. Danielle DeFries. So essentially for my research area, I'm studying short chain fatty acids, which are just a type of nutrient that our gut bacteria produces when we eat various types of foods, such as fruits and vegetables. And essentially, I'm trying to figure out how short chain fatty acids modify properties of a group of cells in our intestines known as enteric glial cells. So basically, I'm just trying to see whether short chain fatty acids can be used as a potential therapeutic strategy to fix intestinal inflammation and intestinal barrier disruption. As for my future goals, one of my future goals is to continue research and perhaps do a PhD once I complete my master's. So this is that that is the reason as to why I'm doing my master's. Wonderful, thank you. Brad, would you like to go next? Sure, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Brad. I'm also in the second year of the Bioscience Tech and Public Policy Program. Um, a little different story than Michelle. Uh, I grew up in Ontario, which is the neighboring province to uh, Manitoba. I went to school at Trent University, which is like an hour and a half north of Toronto. Um, and I did an environmental science uh, undergraduate degree there. But halfway through, I decided biology was much more interesting. Uh, and so I double majored in environment and biology. Um, I did an international uh, exchange year. I lived in Scotland. Um, we did a lot of uh, marine fisheries work while I was there, and I did a little bit of a, a research project that introduced me to uh, science research, and I fell in love. And so uh, transferred back to finish my last year in Ontario, um, started my first ever research project, loved it, uh, and then found out about U Winnipeg. And I transferred to U Winnipeg uh, for the project, but I came to really love the school. I think one of the the keystones of UW is, uh, you know, it's, it's community feeling. It's a smaller school. You really get to know all of the people uh, within and outside of your department. Um, you know, me and Michelle, we bump into each other uh, every now and again, and we can catch up on each other's research. Um, right now, my research at UW is focused on, as Craig said earlier, the behavior and physiology of uh, trophy fisheries and understanding how they respond to catch and release angling, which is a really popular um, pastime here in this province and across Canada. Um, I am very close to finishing. I'm going to start my PhD back at Trent, hopefully, uh, in September, and I'll be looking at uh, a new type of technology that they've developed to understand when, where, and how predation affects um, prey species using a new uh, it's underwater uh, receiving technology. I can get into it more if anybody's actually interested, but I won't bore you with the details now, but it's very good. Um, my career goals, obviously, with the PhD, I'm working towards research, and I really love it. So I think you guys are all in the right place if that's what your goals are, too. Fabulous. I will go into the second question, and you may have touched, um, you know, provided some answers to this already. But if there's any added, anything you want to add, um, how does the MSc Bioscience program that you're pursuing now align with your future career goals? Yeah, so, or as I mentioned earlier, one of my career goals is to continue a PhD. So this Master of Science program is a two-year thesis-based program, as Dr. Willis mentioned. So during those two years, you're doing your research work, and then you're also taking classes, and perhaps you're even teaching first year biology labs. So during the two years of those experience, um, it's providing me skills and knowledge and lab experience, which are crucial factors for becoming a scientist, which is one of my future career goals. So I think that's how it aligns with my future career goals. I think for me, uh, it's really the connections that you build and understanding that you've in your particular area of research 
or or your topic broadly. It's the things that you kind of collect on your master's adventure, and those things really like will will tell you whether or not academics is the way to go, or if you're more interested in something like government jobs or consulting, as we said before. But um, a master's really, really clearly, at least for me, laid out the path I want to take afterwards. Thank you. Um, Dr. Willis, do you have anything else to add? I, I think uh, Michelle and Brad have covered it, you know, really well. No, I'll let, I'll let you go on with your questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so you talk a little bit about your experience at the University of Winnipeg. You talk about the small community. Um, can you talk, elaborate a little bit more, your overall academic and student life experience? Okay. Yeah. So um, with my experience here, I love it. I truly am having a great time. And one of my most favorite things about this school is that it is a smaller school. So it's a smaller cohort. So you know everyone in the program. This includes all the other grad students, um, the professors, the lab technicians, even the security guards and the janitors you see on a daily basis and you actually talk to them and you get to know them. Everyone is so friendly and willing to help you in whatever way possible. The professors here are very hands-on. They guide you through the program and of course the students. So a lot of them are actually international students from either Nigeria, India, Sri Lanka, um, many more places, or they're even students from outside the province, such as Brad. And again, just everyone is so sweet and so friendly, and you just grow a bond over time with the other grad students. So we even have certain days right now where grad students play certain sports together. Uh, Brad can probably talk more about that later because he does go on a weekly basis. So we play things such as badminton, basketball, soccer, and a lot of grad students actually hang out outside of school. So you come very, you become very, very close with your classmates. And I know that's an important factor to a lot of international students because their families are not here. So your classmates sort of become your second family. So that's the one thing that I really do love about this program. And I'll just try and build off of that. She covered it perfectly. Um, Winnipeg as a city, it doesn't feel really huge or big. This is my first time living in a major city. And as a city, as she said, you a lot of people hang out with the people that they meet at UW um, just in their on their weekends or when they have time to spend. Um, it's very, very community focused. You always feel like you're there's someone to talk to. You guys can, you know, share similar experiences in the program. You know, you have people to lean on if you need. And I mean, it's been it's been fantastic. Yeah, I might just add. I think the th the theme coming out of that is is small, relatively small institution, um, and I I agree with all of those sentiments. Uh, the community feel is is really palpable, um, and I think it is a really great strength of the place. Uh, speaking as a, a supervisor. Uh, uh, it's also really, uh, in some ways, great to work at a small school because problem solving is sometimes easier. And this, so hopefully we can spare the students from seeing uh, some of the problems that come up in the background from time to time. But we have great administrative support from folks like Michaela, who can help us navigate challenges that come up with funders or with uh, uh, collaborators or with uh, with uh, permit issuing agencies, those kinds of things. Uh, being at a small school um, uh, is great from the sort of social side, from the collaborative side, I think, um, and also from the just getting stuff done side, which I think is important too. Great. Thank you to all three of you. I will also just add that um, we have some wonderful students helping us out as a student ambassadors in the graduate studies program. So we, we try to have some uh, social events, like we had a trivia event. I think Brad, your team got some, uh, some prize in that event. Uh, so at least a couple of events um, every term. We have a little bit more formalized sports community now too in the grad students. So they're really building that community. And um, I can definitely say uh, it's, it's really amazing to see that um, camaraderie among the grad students. 
Um, so my other question is, um, you know, the mentors and your supervisors are a major part of your graduate journey. Um, and they, you know, talk a little bit more about our supervisors and our mentors and how um, they help you shape and, you know, navigate your career path. Yeah, so uh, for me, one of my biggest mentor and supporter during this program is, of course, my supervisor. My supervisor has been with me each step of the way from applying, choosing courses, figuring out my research, training me in the lab. Um, so without all her help, I wouldn't be here today. And another major supporter um, are the students in the program. So they play a huge role. Um, I've created such a huge bond with a lot of them because of course they're going through the same experience as you. You see them every day during these two years. And again, I love how close everyone is in this program and the grad students in this program just support one another. And it's one of the things that I truly do love about this program. And I think that's what makes this experience so much more enjoyable is because of the students here. And of course the professors, um, they guide you through the courses that you take with them and they're always available if you have any questions or if you need help any, uh, with anything, uh, they're more than happy to help you in any possible way that they can. I would argue that your supervisor, your mentors are the most important component of your master degree. If you're not interested in what it is you're researching or your mentor, maybe your supervisor's mentorship style doesn't align with your needs as a student. And so kind of to go back to some of the questions that I keep seeing in the chat, you know, it takes some time to really nail down a supervisor and, and find one that is willing to take you on and that has an opening that you're interested in and that supervises you the way that you need to be supervised to succeed. Um, and, and sometimes you don't uh, hear back. So the best way is to just keep, keep at it, keep trying, keep emailing. Um, cold emailing is what some people call it, just sending an email to anyone and yeah, taking the time to, to build those relationships. Um, I found taking courses, the courses of the master's degree to be more enjoyable than my undergraduate courses because they were smaller. And as Michelle said, you, you have that connection with the supervisor, you guys are on a different level now. Um, and so, you know, learning is, is more engaging. And so my supervisor, Caleb, he's, you know, one of my, one of my friends now, I would say. And I think that's, you know, a kind of a, a way that shows, you know, the people that are here are the right kind of people that you want to engage with as an academic student. All, all of that, I think, is really very well said. Uh, in terms of finding a supervisor, I'd agree with all of that. And also, don't get discouraged if you don't hear back. Uh, many of us get many, many inquiries. Uh, but that, that, and that means what, whatever you can do to make yours stand out. Sometimes you don't hear back because it's just gone in the spam. So try again, maybe a week or 10 days later. Um, if you don't hear back right away, uh, sometimes folks are just overwhelmed, right, uh, with too many emails to deal with. So uh, that's a good, great reason to try and really give a clear indication to a prospective supervisor that, A, you've got some relevant experience or past evidence of an interest in their field, uh, B, that you've read some of their papers, some of their publications, and most of our research active faculty if you can't find them on the university website, you'll be able to find them by doing uh, searches on a place like Google Scholar or Web of Science. Um, academics are like everyone else, maybe a bit more so in this regard. We run a little bit on ego power. So if you can uh, give us some evidence that you've read our work and find it interesting, that is gonna make your, your sort of approach to a prospective supervisor stand out, right? You don't want to go overboard with that, but uh, we want students that are interested in what we do. As Brad said, that makes the whole process better for you, and it makes the whole process better for us. Uh, what students get from their supervisors uh, is great, but supervisors also get a ton from you as students as well. Uh, we are you know, energized and pushed in, in our thinking and 
um, made to uh, you know think in new and creative ways by great grad students. Um, and so that interaction is fantastically beneficial for us too. Um, and so uh, we want folks that are really keen on, on what we're doing, right? Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll stop there for that point. Great advice. And thank you again to all of you. I've come to my last question uh, for our two students. Um, what would be your advice for someone who's going to take this course? Um, and what made you successful? Is there anything we'd like to spare? I think our, uh, Brad already touched on this, but I think my one piece of advice would be to choose a research area that you are actually interested in because you will be doing that for two years. So for instance, if you're interested in fish biology research, do fish biology research or if plant research, or if you're interested in health and disease, look for a professor whose research of interest aligns within that area of study. So as mentioned, there is a variety of research being conducted at the University of Winnipeg, from bat research to fish to plants to health and disease. So just look through that uh, University of Winnipeg biology page because it does show each of the professors in the biology department and what the research area is. So that is one way of figuring out which potential supervisor you may want to work with in the future. So again, just choose a research area that you are interested in. My advice is short and simple. Uh, do the side quests. That's my biggest advice to you is like, you know, it's one thing to be very good at your academic area of expertise and you have to do the research and you have to work very hard, but other things enrich your experience as a master's student. And those could be things like the 3MT that Michelle's rocking right now. Those could be public lectures that you give at, a, at the local Millennium Library. Those could be working with collaborators outside of your academic network. For me, those are uh, provincial fisheries managers that have fun you know, little projects happening outside of the university. And so going and getting involved in your community, uh, volunteering, those types of things, I think it really makes uh, your time uh, worthwhile. All absolutely great points. I think uh, I, I would uh, add to those. Yeah, those are just sensational. I would add, add to those. Um, often when you arrive for a graduate program, uh, you're working in a group, right? So you're not, uh, it's not just you working one-on-one -on -one with a supervisor all the time, but uh, you're in a research group with other students. Sometimes those are postdocs and PhD students and undergrad students. Um, and so being a team player is a huge, uh, a, a huge advantage, um, looking for ways to not just seek support for your own success, but to encourage and help along the success of your colleagues, um, that helps everyone. And, and I think that's one of the things that I know many of our supervisors really look for in prospective students, evidence of team skills, uh, and the ability to work well with a bunch of different people. Science, bioscience in particular, is a collaborative exercise. And that's why I think the points that Michelle and Brad just made are so important. Um, often it's outside of just sitting at the lab bench pipetting or working out in the field or doing your statistical analysis at the computer. It's the side stuff where you start a conversation that ends up leading to some incredibly cool collaboration that you hadn't thought about before, right? So being open to those ideas, um, being open to those interactions and being a great team player, I think is uh, advice I would give. Thank you everyone. That was a really great um, Q&A session and you answered with some really good advice and, um, you know, the um, steps that students can take. I'm going to stop recording here and we will um, go to our Q&A. Um, so again, thanks everyone who um, is still with us. And let me just...